and welcome to AI-based visual advising and convenience stores. I'm your host today, Casey Brandt. If you go to the next slide. And then Gray Taylor is going to be your moderator today. He's the executive director here at Connexus. So we have an agenda today, as showed you here on the screen. Got a few quick things to go through before we get started into the session for today. So for housekeeping, the replay for this session will be made available on the Connexus365.org website. You can send questions directly through the GoToWebinar interface. So please feel free to send those in early. The sooner we get them, the sooner we can get them in the line to get answered. So the PCI credits are available for qualifying live events. So please contact us if you're interested in that. There is a little bit of a disclaimer. So this slide is um, one that our lawyer makes us put in. If you'll go to the next one, there we go. That shows the disclaimer. It shows um, that the views and opinions of the speaker today are only those of the speaker and not Connexus ourselves. The next slide shows our 2022 Diamond sponsors. So it's a huge thank you and shout out to our sponsors at Connexus. The support is really appreciated and allows us to continue the work that we do on behalf of the industry. Go to the next slide. Um, so a little bit about Connexus. Connexus is a nonprofit technology organization. Our members really do the heavy lifting here. So we provide a neutral forum where retailers and vendors can network and come together to create standards and solutions that are beneficial to our industry. We also educate through white papers and events like this one at Connexus 365. And we advocate on technical levels at other organizations to help steer the conversation around standards and policies so that changes don't negatively affect your business. So on the next slide, it goes into how to contact us. You can contact us on LinkedIn, Connexus.org, and Connexus365.org. At Connexus365, we are an education subscription series. So coming up next, we have a Connect with Connexus on September 22nd. This is for Connectus, Connexus members, as well as full subscribers of Connexus 365. It's an open forum event with the staff where we'll be taking a look at the upcoming events such as the NAX show, the Connexus technology roadmap and whatever questions attendees have. All right, now I'm gonna turn it over to Gray to introduce our speaker for today. Gray. Thanks, Casey. Um, it's really a pleasure to have um, Sridhar Sudarsan on uh, on this uh, this uh, 365 event. Um, if you may recall, back in 2017, 18, when we started working on the uh, technology roadmap for the industry, which was looking at future technologies <clears throat> that um, on a commercially available basis, um, we had put computer vision out at about five years, um, and it was something that we were tracking pretty intensely because of the power of what this brings. Um, in the last month or so, I got introduced to Spark Cognition and uh, Sridhar and I have uh, had a lot of coffee together at a coffee shop in Cedar Park as we look to take what they've already done and kind of craft it for a retail application. And what you're about to see is really foundationally um, very impressive. Uh, so without uh, any more, I'm going to let Sridhar uh, go through his own deck and tell us all about what they're doing over at Spark Cognition. Thank you very much, Gray. Um, really appreciate the, the kind introduction and the opportunity for me to speak to the, the team here at Connexus 365. Um, so what we're going to go over today is... Um, how can we get business insights through using a visual advice, visual AI advisor um, solution that we have at Spark Cognition? But um, before I do any of that, one of the things that I wanted to sort of go over here first is what are we going to cover here within the next hour or so? What is the premise for what are we thinking about? And what we're really offering here is for these personas, so whether you're in the store as a manager, as a clerk, uh, or whether you have managers, clerks, regional managers, executives, partners, vendors, um, it's all about how do you increase your revenue in the store through the use of better inventory management, heat mapping of customers, how do you better understand your customers, how do you get... Um, a lot more visibility on an ongoing continuous basis across operations within your stores and around your stores? And how do you enhance um, safety and security, right? So th that's the core of what we will be covering today, hopefully, and being able to answer some of these questions, um, whether you can do this now 
uh, without completely disrupting your uh, existing setup, whether it's hardware or software, and and with a reasonable investment without really thinking about this as being a very, very large investment. So hopefully, um, hopefully in the next you know, 45 minutes or so, we can answer some of these questions based on how we are seeing this being done, specifically using a visual, a visual, our visual AI advisor. So let's jump right in. Um, if you think about cameras, now most of you have cameras or use cameras within our stores. Every one of us has probably encountered these. And the traditional approach using um, cameras, think CCTV cameras, PTZ cameras, facing forecourt, uh, facing being in the inside, you know, pointing at the cashier, or the back office. Think of all of those as being examples of these. Um, the traditional approach is that you collect, you store. You know, sometimes you know that they are working, sometimes you don't until it's much later. Um, all of the playback happens in a in a retrospective way. It's used when you need to go look at it and then you spend hours or somebody spends hours and hours looking through that. There's no real-time insights, right? But every single store very likely has cameras. Uh, every single surrounding area of the store very likely has a handful of cameras. So what are we talking about here is an AI-enabled approach where we're turning these passive um, sensors, which is, i.e. cameras, so to speak, into something very active, proactively being able to monitor uh, people, processes, assets, um, you know, pro and and be able to sort of uh, get alerted uh, to your to the right stakeholders, be able to either take immediate action, uh, corrective feedback as appropriate, or be able to sort of look at it on a time series basis and be able to uh, to take the appropriate. Um, action that applies across the board. And um, ultimately what this does is to reduce incident rates, to increase your productivity, your sales, your footfall, better get visibility so you can take the best informed decision. So that's what this is all about in terms of how, well, how we've done this and what this looks like. So let me start by um, talking about a few key principles that are foundational for the Spark Cognition Visual AI Advisor. These were some things that we thought were fundamental before we built our, our solution. And I've continued to keep sort of very close to how we've made every single um, technology decision in terms of how we've evolved the product over the last several years. So it is about using as many existing CCTVs as possible, which means you know the first thing is not that you need the latest and greatest uh, cameras only, it can work with multiple you know, even prior generation cameras, including analog cameras in many cases. Um, and the idea is that we will configure many use cases to a camera. Now I'll, I'll go into what a use case is and we'll see many examples of these today, but the idea is it's not one camera for one thing. It is one camera potentially for many things. So if you have a camera facing inside the store, you don't need 10 cameras for detecting 10 types of things. Um, that's that's kind of a, a core principle, and that's one way of managing cost uh, massively. There are many out of the box use cases. What that means is it is uh, time to value, which we can deploy cases uh, these use cases within days, not months, not we not weeks, not months, uh, but literally sometimes hours and and uh, certainly within days. And we can scale this to many, many tens of thousands of cameras because of the fact that we have a no-code platform that allows us to not only deploy these, but also to extend these solutions, add use cases to existing cameras, add more use cases, and manage your entire set of stores if you have, you know, let's say, dozens of stores or hundreds of stores or even thousands of stores. Um, the... Uh, alerting uh, mechanism, you, nobody needs to be actually actively watching the camera. Now, I will show you a few examples of videos today, but primarily it is to show how real-time the detections are. But in reality, once this is deployed, nobody really needs to be looking at a camera. Um, what it does is it provides you proactive alerts so that at, with evidence, explainability is very important, so that you can take the appropriate action, integrate with the existing systems if you might have. So for example, you know, I might, I will show you some dashboards that we have, but you don't need to use our dashboards. We can even make this available in a headless manner to integrate not only with your dashboards, but also maybe with your IoT systems. If you wanna turn machines off, 
uh, turn machines on, you know, shut down certain things as an in emergency uh, for emergency purposes. We can do that as well. And then uh, one thing that I will talk about a little bit more it, it, later on is the fact that you know every time there's a video and a, a video and AI and analytics involved, there's a little bit of a nervousness about where am I sending this video to and who is processing it and who's storing it and all that good stuff. The reality is, uh, to make it very simple, we don't store, we as Spark Cognition don't store any video. We don't record any video. It is all happening at the edge, which means the pro video is being processed at the edge as it is streaming and going into your own recording system. None of that comes into um, you know, our cloud or any other outside you know, uh, area that it doesn't need to go to. So these are very, very important key principles that we uh, kept in mind as we built and evolved this solution. So what are use cases? Um, it, the use cases are, as I said, we have over 130 use cases um, that are immediately available out of the box. And it's not limited to that because we continuously add use cases as we go along. Um, and that repository continues to rapidly evolve. But if I want to simplify them rather than going through all of them, it's it's one one way of thinking about them is in these case, in these buckets of uh, categories, so to speak. Um, so health and safety, you know, accidents, near misses, fires, um, if somebody's smoking by a pump, if there is a a compliance issue, somebody's not wearing the right kind of vest, um, you know, or hairnet within a kitchen, all of these sort of fall within the health and safety. Security includes things like intrusions, theft, um, access control, right? Is the right person, only authorized person standing behind a cashier's uh, counter, going into the back room, cooler room. All of those fall under security. Productivity are things like uh, queuing time, wait times. Um, you know, do we need to have another counter opened up or can we shut it down and 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 manage it more proactively in a more appropriate, in a more sort of just in time way, so that a your customers are not leaving on it are not left unattended, and at the same time you're not overstaffing. And today's world, um, staffing and resourcing is one of the most um, you know uh, most complex sort of things to to account for because of shortage of resources, because of challenges that is uh, th that that we in the world are are facing uh, from an econ economical perspective. Um, <clears throat> inspection, you know, quality lines, uh, and this can be whether you, whether it's in the warehouse, whether it's in the stores, um, being able to detect that. An inspection could also in our in our case specifically, mean inspecting the uh, or, or checking on the stocking of products on shelves and so on, which is also a part of the same sort of bucket of use cases, so to speak. Uh, and then situational awareness is all about um, your footfall analytics, people analytics, so the right person, is the person fueling and coming into the store? How many times are they coming in? You know, Can you detect that? Can you sort of whitelist things? Can you determine if there are suspicious behavior, right? Lurking and things like that. Uh, so these are all examples of situational awareness that we also uh, have as a category of use cases. As I mentioned, this is really just to indicate and showcase what some of these are, uh, not, not to be like a fully exhaustive list. So uh, let me dive into, rather than, you know, seeing is believing in the vision space, um, so let me dive into a few examples of these videos that you can start uh, that we can start looking at. So here's an example of a forecourt. Um, this is um, where you can see one camera, and there are many things that we are looking at. So you can see in the bottom it's camera five, um, and what is uh, and I'll play this one more time uh, in case this is paused. So what you can see is it's a short clip, but I'll, I'll play it a couple of times just to make a couple of key points here. So number one, you can see that we're monitoring multiple uh, pumps in this one camera. Number two, you can see that we are counting the number of cars in the queue um, and how many of these are waiting. So for example, as a CMO of an organization, if you wanna hand out coupons, if there's a long line or a long wait for cars in certain areas, you can do that. Uh, or if you want to track um, specifically and uh, perhaps sort of uh, provide some kind of an incentive for the person to come into the store while they're waiting, you know, a variety of things that you can start doing. Uh, the other thing you track here is the type of vehicle, 
um, you'll notice that there is a uh, blurring that is uh, occurring on the license plate. Well, in this particular case, we've blurred it because you know it is it is a real video, and so we didn't want to share that. However, the reality is what this means is that we can detect license plates. So you can use license plates, which I believe is is okay to use in a in a four court setting here as well, uh, to be able to track loyalty of customers and be able to sort of find a way for them to opt into your loyalty program. Another thing you see here is whether or not, you know, an appropriate person is present. Uh, in this case, you know, um, whether they're wearing the right uniforms, uh, whether they're, what the lighting is of this uh, location. One of the things that is, um, that is a cause or for somebody to enter or not enter, especially at nights into a gas station is the level of lighting. So you can see that we can monitor in this same use case, not showing you in this particular video, but you can also look at whether or not there is um, spit, there are spills that need cleanup, all of those can be monitored uh, right away. And then, oh, by the way, on the compliance perspective, you're also seeing that there's a fire extinguisher present or not. So it's one camera, many use cases, all directly relevant. And by the way, this is an, an actual deployment uh, that we're talking about. Uh, let me show you another view here, which is a, a different use case. Again, talking a little bit about queuing of cars, and you can see how the blue line, uh, the blue polygon, not the line, is really a region of interest. Not, as you can imagine, it's an overlay. It's not a real line or tape on the ground. And we're live monitoring uh, vehicles and queuing up. In this case, it's an air filling station. You're tracking not only the fact that there are, there's a count. You see the vehicle count go up when that white car pulls in but it also shows you how long each vehicle is taking to uh, be serviced. And, and in this case, we're showing you on cars, it's the exact same thing that works for people as well. And you can have the counter. So for example, at a, at a restaurant, uh, if you have a food um, area or if you have multiple counters, uh, cashiers, you can see how long people are waiting and take the appropriate action accordingly. So uh, again, very important to be able to uh, detect that and another example of how we're doing multiple things in the same place. Now, those were two outdoor examples. Let me show you another one. Uh, this one is indoor. This is at a plaza, but it's it's really, uh, you know, the same principle applies to any store or, do uh, or uh, any sort of indoor or outdoor areas. But what you're seeing here is a heat mapping. What we're showing you is how you can track the footfall of that customer or the person within a small zone, right? So here you're seeing only for the entry and the exit points, the exit on the left and the entry on the right. But what this allows us to do is, let's say even within a convenience store that you might have a few hundred square feet or a few thousand square feet, you can actually start mapping to see where customers are spending more time, less time, right? There might be simple things like, hey, where the um, where the AC vent is on a hot day and there's there, there's sort of more uh, time that people are spending, but it might be something even more complex than that based on the products and, and where things are. So you can start now mapping that and being able to take product placement decisions or um, or being able to stock appropriate things in the right places based on the heat map, right? Very important. And, and it's something that we can track and you can see how real time that we can track it. While this may or may not be actionable in immediate basis, you can also view this over a time series way. So you can look, you know, on a certain days of the week and certain day, uh, hours of the day, you know, weeks of the month, is that is that heat map changing and why? So especially as you from a corporate perspective, when you look at things, you can make broader decisions and and you can even compare one store to the next, right? One region to the next, and see if how you can apply those best practices very, very quickly, rather than waiting for months to be able to do that. Um, here's another example of, of uh, Q analysis. And uh, th this was just a uh, an example that we showed, so it's not a real one, but that's why they're all security guards here sort of simulating it. But really the key thing here to look at in this case, as you see, there are about four, um, uh, four uh, three or four Qs. And all, by the way, the yellow lines are the lines that we have overlaid. And, and this is all done through a, a very simple no-code platform. I'll just show you a, a brief example of what that looks like, but it's essentially think about it as being, you have the camera, you have the view, you draw the polygons or the lines that you want to measure as your regions of interest. And then uh, you drop, drag and drop the appropriate use case you want. There's a, sometimes there's a small bit of tuning we do 
we deploy, we test the view, and and we go live, right? That's that's essentially how how this works. Uh, so let me show this one more time. But really, what is happening is, uh, and again, you can do this on uh, if you have multiple cashier counters, multiple food counters, you can start sort of determining how best you can look through. Um, uh, the queues and take appropriate action. Is a customer being leaving without being serviced, as an example? Is there is the line building up too long in one queue versus the other? And is there certain actions you need to take? So all of those are doable uh, through this simple example of a queue analysis. Um, here's another one where we are now monitoring, and this is a retail store. Uh, this particular case is a, uh, a you know a, a large retail store. It's actually two different views on the left and the right. Uh, where in this case it is a jewelry store, and but really it's the same thing that can apply for many different types of stores. The key point here is that there are uh, regions of interest again that we've marked, right? So on the right you can see the yellow boxes is are the regions of interest. What we are doing here is we're monitoring what is actually happening at the cashier. And we're trying to determine um, you know, how much time people are spending in service. You're counting the number of people, simple things like how many people are coming in, how many um, people are actually at a table, how long they're at a table. Uh, and you can see, for example, on the top on the right, there's a table zero, table one, two, three, and then, um, and then there's a yes or no flag right now. It's a simple flag that we've shown just for demonstration purposes, whether somebody is sitting at a table or not. Uh, so you, you just notice that somebody just walked up to table two and, and so um, the table two became a yes. Um, so there's, again, the same, uh, same idea that I'd mentioned before where there are many different use cases being monitored on the exact same camera. Uh, people count, security, you can do theft, um, and um, you know if somebody is picking up certain things and not sort of uh, stopping at the checkout booth, all of those things can be monitored with the same kind of uh, view. So same camera on the left, we're counting people exiting and entering, and on the right, we're looking at how they're being monitored, how they're being serviced at the at the um, uh, the service desk, right at at these uh, sort of desks that they have. So again, and each one can be alerted to a different person. So the left may be more interesting for a security person, the right may be more interesting for a marketing person uh, so or a salesperson, and you can take the appropriate action and each one can be alerted differently. So it's an ultra configurable, extensible platform that we have. Uh, let me now show shift to the back office. Um, so if you look at uh, here, this is a restaurant, a bakery, in fact, and the back office of, of a bakery. Uh, as you can see, it's a pastry. Uh, you know, uh, they're making pastries here. And in this case, we're tracking whether they're wearing the right protective equipment. Are they wearing uh, the appropriate sort of face masks, hair nets? Uh, how many people are there? Um, you know, this way you can make sure that the right people, by the way, we can also do um, authorized people detection or denied people detection. So um, you can make sure that the right people, only the authorized people are allowed in the kitchen area um, and nobody else is because that can be potentially a cause for a large violation. The other thing that we are not showing here, but that we can do, for example, is you see the, um, uh, and I don't know if those are cakes or pastries or, or dough that is laid out on the table on the left there, but um, essentially we can count those as well. Just like we're counting people, we can also count uh, you know, things that are laid out, whether it's on a fryer, chicken on a fryer, whether it is uh, you know, burgers on a, on a grill, um, whether it is tomatoes in a bin so that you can make sure you're not running out of ingredients, especially if you're... Um, if you are taking you know orders and combining it with some kind of a delivery service, you don't want a customer to make an order to place an order when you're close to running out of key ingredients and then for the customer to be unsatisfied. So you can manage all of these things based on a simple uh, camera that very likely you already have today. And by positioning it appropriately, you can manage all of these things and we can configure multiple of these use cases and provide the results for you, right? So this is, we saw the front office, we saw the forecourt, here's the back, uh, back office and more from a restaurant perspective. Now, the one thing that I keep getting asked all the time when we talk about videos and images 
By the way, all the video, uh, the uh, the discussions that we've had so far, while we were talking about fixed CCTV cameras, they can also work with, uh, you know, moving cameras, right? Whether it's uh, it's moving cameras on a truck, uh, if you have a distribution service, whether it is, um, you know, a camera that is on your uh, on your phones that somebody is actually taking video clips off for certain types of uh, things. Uh, it, the same solution works across all of those. Now, the quality of images. Now, obviously, we want good quality of images, but we've had, we've, you know, our most common ones that we find is 1080p, uh, but we worked on lower and higher resolution uh, images as well. Uh, the processing, um, you know, uh, time sometimes changes, and but there's no bandwidth change. There's no bandwidth requirements because, as I mentioned, it's all <clears throat> processing on the edge. So there is no need to stream videos. But one thing on the quality, let me, uh, and again, seeing is believing. So let me just show you a few examples. And these are live deployments in the Indian subcontinent where um, in this particular case, the franchise uh, company wants to determine the stocking of uh, coolers. And, uh, and these, you know, in, in, in this case, at least, you know, they have foot soldiers that are going out and taking pictures. These are the order bookers. They're taking pictures of the cooler and we're trying to determine three things automatically. One, what is the air percentage? How full is the cooler or not? Uh, second, <clears throat> what is the um, efficiency of, of the cooler? Which means, are you really using the cooler for the right product? So obviously in this case, PepsiCo uh, provided the cooler or the bottler provided the coolers. So they wanna make sure that it's stocked with Pepsi products and not, <clears throat> excuse me, not competitor products or, or other things. So we're tracking that as well. And all of these, by the way, we're doing right there on the phone and being able to provide that uh, information to the order booker so that they can have a good conversation with the retailer. Now imagine the same thing uh, in, in the stores here in the US where you can have a camera pointing at a beer cooler, at a, at a drink cooler, at shelves, uh, cigarette stocking of shelves, um, and be able to quickly notify uh, you as a supplier, perhaps, as to the fact that your stocks are are reducing or are getting low and you need to replenish it. Uh, but, but the other point that I want to make here is on the quality of images. So as you can see, for example, in that first image is, is quite decent, but it's still, you know, um, there, there's a lot of stocking in a number of different ways. There are bottles that are vertical, there are bottles that are horizontal. But, you know, the more interesting ones are the third and the fourth pictures here on the right, where you know, it's, it's very hard to know what is actually going on because of the condensation on the door, uh, but we can still, the image processing can actually still detect that. And you can see the percentages and these are verified uh, images. So they're they're hard to detect as a human, but you know, in, in reality, they actually opened the door and they they took a look at it. And so we know these are, uh, these are the right kinds of uh, numbers that the customer in this case was looking for. But again, wanted to show you this, that um, even within a stocking inventory uh, ma uh, management, uh, you know, uh, being able to sort of not have somebody go out manually and do a count of, of uh, products in the in the refrigerator or on the shelf um, are different ways of how you can use a, a low cost way to sort of effectively get access to that information at all times in real time. So um, those were just a flavor of a, a few different use cases that I wanted to share and show. Um, as I mentioned, we can keep going on and on, but uh, just in the interest of time, I wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk and zoom out now about, uh, and to talk about how does, great, now we can detect all these images uh, at these videos um, it, it looks great that you know you can do these detections in in very good time in real time even despite quality of images being bad. What do I do with it, right? How do I get information like that? So here's how actually our customers are using things like this. So we do, as I mentioned at the beginning, have dashboards that we can provide that actually give you the performance not only of an outlet but across outlets. It gives you um, performance across many, many dimensions. So for example, on the left here, you can see, uh, hopefully you can see if you squint your eyes a little bit, uh, on the top, there are five KPIs that this company was looking for across safety, customer service, uh, the look and feel of the, of the store or the forecourt in this particular case, the operations and the overall score. And the fact is that uh, this is showing you for one, but you, you, they have a way where you can drag down, uh, drop down. And in this case, we've deployed actually over uh, 
over 4,000 outlets and are continuing to ramp up to deploy uh, another 10,000 more in the next uh, three months. So um, so they you can get this sort of at a glance view, so to speak. Uh, you can look at, you know, and, and look at many different trends here, not just a snapshot one-time view. You're ranking your top 10 stores at any given time, and you can make it a friendly competition, like gamify it, right? And you Because now you can, versus making it an expensive proposition, having some you know, spot checks or or some supervisor go in and, and do sort of uh, surprise checks because you never know the full picture of what is actually happening. Um, you're only rewarding what you see at, you know, uh, it could be, you know, an indicator or it may not be an indicator. Um, so you can see this, you know, wait time trends, you know, overall exceptions, all of these attendance, you know, non-compliance, compliance, things like that um, on the left. You can also look at uh, demographics, right? Whether it's the profile of the vehicles, the types, uh, and this is all around, uh, you know, very high interest that we've seen for uh, the the customer in this case, uh, the customer persona is the CMO, because they are very 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 interested in looking at loyal customers. You know what what kind of demographics there are, what vehicles in this case, and so on. So all of that information is available, and uh, there's. Again, as I mentioned earlier, you might already have your own dashboards doing all of this and then some. We can even provide this as an API and hook into your dashboard if that if that is kind of the desire that you have. But if not, then we have our own as well. Uh, here's just a couple of quick uh, more examples on uh, on a drill down of some of the same dashboards. So you saw the previous one was analysis on the top here uh, where we see the uh, uh, you know, the, the tabs, uh, there's analysis. These are showing you by exceptions. So where are the most problematic things that I need to look at, right? Specific tasks, layout of compliance, uh, cleanliness, uh, presence or absence of certain things, visits by loyal customers versus everybody else. These are all what we call as, you know, exception type scenarios. You can also look at attendance, um, you know, in terms of are the right people uh, showing up or not. And I'm sure there are other ways of tracking it using badging, but here's a simple visual way of tracking that as well. And then the right, uh, you see, you know, analysis based on violations, queuing, compliance, and things like that, right? So the point is all the things that we saw in that video, as I mentioned, nobody needs to be looking at it because you get all that information either through an API or through these dashboards at all times. Uh, here's an example of sort of the attendance and employees. You can you can actually reward the employees appropriately, right? It's a tough market right now with uh, with uh, the clerks at the retail store um, constantly sort of uh, churning. You know, not as much the shortage of people uh, across industries that we're coming across, but um, but there are little things that you can do to reward the right behavior rather than just sort of penalize the non-existence of certain things. And now you can actually do that, right? And, and so in this particular case, you know, there's a constant employee of the month, you know, clerk of the month, because you can very easily track to, and in a transparent way, provide that. Um, everybody is now trying to, you know, do that, right? And I think we as humans are, are creatures of habit and, and, uh, and, and like to be rewarded for good behavior. Here's a simple way that you can, right? It's a very, very cost-effective way but it's a it's a motivational thing that you can start bringing in, especially as the market right now is is tough. Um, so these are these are examples of uh, what how we're using it now, and and that was sort of surfacing up the insights. So we saw the videos, we saw the surfacing up insights. I'm sure one of the questions that is going through all of our minds the moment I talk about video and analysis and analytics and AI all in the same sentence. The first thing is, what about privacy? What about concerns on regulations? What about you know places in like in California or other places um, where you know we we need to be sort of mindful of uh, of privacy concerns? What we uh, we we have by the way deployed in in unionized environments. We have deployed in Europe, um, so we are uh, aware of that. As I mentioned, there's no uh, there's multiple layers of how we're resolving it. I already talked about deployment at the edge and no video leaving thing uh, the premise as you need uh, as as appropriate because all processing is happening. No storage of any additional videos. And here's an example. While we do provide the evidence on the um, you know on the actual violation or or the dashboard or any trigger that you need to look at. 
there's a way, and you saw this even in the four chord video for us to detect. And because we can identify things, we also have a toggle where you can blur specific PII labels, license plates, faces, brands, badges, any of those things. Here's a couple of examples of how you know that is happening in this particular case. You can see on the left and the right, there's a person sitting on the machine too close. Uh, machine, the hand is too close to where it need, then where it needs to be. And while the violation is important and we capture it, in this particular case, the, the customer chooses to not want to know who the violator is. And so we have the ability to blur the face as well. You saw the same thing in the previous example where in one of the examples of the forecourt where we had blurred the license plate. So very important, we understand it because that's the way you trust the system. And when you trust the system, the system as a learning system will pay back. And, uh, and I think everybody wins, right? It's an augmented sort of way of humans and machines working together. So just shifting gears uh, real quick to talk, uh, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but just uh, on the deployment scheme. Uh, so great, we understand the technology, we understand what it does and some of the key benefits of this. Hopefully the idea of the use cases to show you that was really to hopefully spur some ideas within your own specific environment. But here's kind of how we very simply think about a deployment. So I, I did mention how soon, how long does it take to deploy? It's usually a couple, three weeks to get it going. Uh, uh, and, you know, depending on sort of what the complexity of the architecture is, uh, what what the what the type of IT uh, requirements you have within your environment. But as I said, we are processing the images locally within the environment in an image processor, and all we're storing in the cloud is the dashboards, and um, and the and that app visual advisor, visual AI advisor suite is what we're uh, providing for deployment configurations. It's a one platform that you can use for. As a, it's a no-code one platform. Uh, these are just showing you some examples of the type of hardware and cameras. These are all fairly low-cost hardware, whether it's NVIDIA, whether it's Intel or others that you can use. Um, and here's sort of a little bit more of a double-click on the on the, uh, architecture where uh, you, it's, you read it from the left to right, where we're reading and processing images from the camera converting it into uh, some kind of a real-time streaming protocol, which is why we apply a lot of software uh, technology to it and can work across many different types of cameras. Um, and then we have our core um, uh, visual, the VAIA is really Visual AI Advisor. Um, we have the edge processing piece that sends alerts and notifications to the management portal. We have our core that has a full business layer, and this is what makes it truly extensible is that we can apply uh, AI models, rules, uh, you know, anything that is specific to your notification environment and combine that with the machine learning that we have. So by the way, this is also not a deployed once and then we're done, right? You might learn that you need more things after six months, after a year, you change the configuration of the store, you can deploy all of that. Uh, it's all dockerized and deployed on a, on a container. Um, and, then, and then, as I said, the dashboard is available, by the way, not just as a web app, uh, or as a mobile app, but it can also be available as APIs uh, that you can then deploy within your own dashboard. Uh, and all of these analytics and reports are then produced. Um, <clears throat> here's just a quick snapshot of the no-code platform that I was mentioning a couple of times. It shows you the types of, um, you know, the fact that there are cameras, you just add cameras, you'll have a whole hierarchy of, of uh, systems. Uh, and uh, your stores, your location, your number of cameras. And then once you have that, you just go in, you drag and drop the camera here, you add use case, it brings a pop-up for showing you the, the categories and the specific types of use cases. You then configure those use cases onto a camera. And then right there, you, there's some advanced techniques for configuration, uh, that, advanced uh, properties for configuration that it allows you to do if needed. And then immediately you just say test video, it turns on the video live, you can test whether or not it's actually detecting or not detecting the things you wanted to do, and you deploy. It's as simple as that. And, and that's why we have made it to be, we've made it to be in that way, primarily to reduce the time to value and, um, and increase this sort of rapid tight iteration learning approach that we always want to take in an AI based system. Um, so that's our no code platform. Here's a few other sort of visuals on how we've integrated it with other uh, ways. So we have a mobile platform, as I mentioned. Here's an example of a mobile dashboard. What this also means is if you have your own mobile platform or mobile app, 
you can integrate it into that as well. We've actually integrated this into loyalty apps, into other safety apps, but we've also had customers that have deployed um, our mobile platforms, our, our mobile apps directly as well. So it shows you sort of, you know, how you can get the metrics and a variety of different sort of mobile friendly um, views. Uh, clearly here, you can see a little bit of the social distancing type use cases, which was important, you know, back in, uh, you know, during the COVID peak days. And here it's showing you sort of actual alarm. You can get notified through WhatsApp, through SMS. Um, you can get notified as a, uh, you know, you can, there's a security threat. You can call automatically have police uh, called or the local law enforcement uh, called. Um, so all of these, and, and oh, by the way, I mentioned IoT integration. So in, in this particular case, there was a fire uh, alarm de detection and, and we had an on-site hooter uh, a system that we integrated with in our lab at Hyperworks, we've shown how we can stop a machine. We've actually deployed that in manufacturing environments. You can do this for fuel pumps or other areas as well. So it's a very configurable um, system that we've built, understanding that you know we don't want to come in and say, you got to use our system and nothing else, because that's rarely the case, uh, especially in enterprise systems. Um, so we've built a number of different integration points that we believe uh, can be used. So, um, and then, uh, so this is all great from a technology perspective. We saw what the, um, you know, what the core premise was. It's uh, easy to deploy. It's simple to use. Uh, it works with existing cameras. Uh, we have an approach where we can deploy within days. Um, and we've deployed, uh, you know, you can monitor, measure, and integrate with any existing systems or, or IoT systems or dashboards that you might already have. Um, and, <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me, um, and then the one thing would be, where do you go from here? <clears throat> Assuming that this makes sense, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, what is the, um, uh, how do you get started? It's a, and this is just to, as an indicative, sort of within three or four weeks, you can completely uh, go live and have something running and tested and, and deployed within your environment. So we're not talking about, you know, as I said, months. Um, the, the, once you have a plan for what you want to do and what use cases you're looking for, to start with, you don't have to obsess and try and get every single use case on day one, but once you know the initial ones you want to do, you can always add packets of use cases later on. Uh, but that's really showing you an indicative view of what that you know three to four weeks of timeline to deploy would look like. And once you deploy it on one store and you test it, you can just roll it out one after the other on as many stores as you want. So um, hopefully, you know, as I said, I answered the questions about how it's improving your product uh, sales, your safety, your security, compliance, you know, customer demographics, loyalty programs, and then um, how you can do it with existing infrastructure, more or less existing infrastructure without a very high cost and in quick time, and you can get going now. This is not a future thing. This is something that you can do now. Um, we Just a couple of minutes on who we are as a company, Spark Cognition. Uh, what we focused on here is what you see in that oval on the right, which is the visual AI solution. But we are also very cognizant. We are an AI company, industrial AI company. And we're very cognizant that it's necessary to use visual information, but it's not always sufficient because you want to combine it with payments, with inventory. Those are structured type information. With sensor-based information, those are time series data sets, unstructured data sets, you know, text and so on. And we actually do have a similar platform that works across all of these different data types and that we provide then solutions uh, based on that. What we did zoom in on today was even with just the vision AI, visual AI solution, how you can actually get started and get uh, insights uh, almost immediately within, within a very, very short span of time. So this is who we are as a company. And uh, we've been around for uh, over eight years now, actually about nine years now. Um, and we have about 500 people, um, you know, and we're very uh, passionate about the space of uh, applying artificial intelligence techniques in the industrial area. And we have, as you can see, as a young company like us, we have over 200 patents uh, filed. And, um, and we have uh, quite a plethora of deployments across the board in terms of the types of customers that we use. And we have um, numerous customers in the Fortune uh, 2000 space uh, and, and beyond that we work with. So 
we're, 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 um, we, we have experience, we have scale. In fact, in the visual space, we've deployed over 130,000 cameras and counting rapidly. We're deploying thousands of cameras every month. Um, so rolling out thousands of cameras every month. And so this is something that we are equipped to handle very large scale as well. So um, with that, I do want to uh, thank um, uh, Gray and, and Casey and the Connexus 365 team for the opportunity. And um, I will hand it over to Gray. So the first question came uh, for the Q analysis, does it produce statistics? Uh, question came out early in your presentation, um, but it, 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 um, as you've walked through it, I think we've seen some of the stats that you've done. Um, how do you format and how do you exfiltrate those, those uh, statistics into, a, you know, say an existing business intelligence platform? Yeah, it's a great question, Gray. Um, so the way that, uh, so the answer to, do we have statistics for queues? Yes, we can um, uh, capture that. And there are two two ways of looking at uh, interpreting what that question really means in terms of queue statistics, right? Number one is, in a real on a real time basis, um, do we know what queue lengths are, and uh, is there sort of a queue forming up where, let's say, an additional cashier needs to be notified, or an additional person, you know, at the, at the desk needs to be notified uh, based on wait times? So not just the length of the queue, but also wait times. And uh, so that's an immediate sort of instant notification that can happen, and you can you can have this sort of um, uh, generated and connected to any system or alerting mechanism that is required for the appropriate person. There's a second type, which is over a period of time. So let's say you want to look across a month or across a week or across the times of days or days of the week um, and look at what, how to anticipate and expect queues based on um, the queue lengths. You can also see that kind of a time series view of, uh, of queues. So, and not only can you do this at one store, but you could potentially compare it across different stores and see variations and variabilities that occur, and perhaps point to maybe uh, identify what is causing it or how to prepare for it either way, right? And I think ultimately it's all about actionable insights. So, so that's the kind of a way that we have seen the queue analysis and statistics from these queues being used in both ways. Uh, the instantaneous response and the aggregate analysis for more strategic uh, changes or uh, or inside actions that need to be performed. In terms of can these be exported? Absolutely, as as I mentioned in the in the presentation, both uh, options are possible where these are available through an API that you know you can um, you can either export the data or stream the data into a dashboard you might have yourself. Um, or uh, for those that don't, you can use the dashboard that we provide out of the box as well. So we're we're open to both a headless and a um, you know and one with with the UI that is available. So so has um, has Spark come up with a suite of microservices then that are available for uh, integrators to to get access to the data and is the data um, structured and, and defined so that when we we come up with one data type, we know what that really means. Uh, yeah, so I don't, so what we found is that uh, different industries have slightly different data exchange standards. And so um, I, I believe that's an ongoing process in terms of what a standardized data format is, but we do have a defined data schema in terms of what we produce. And we have the definition of, uh, you know, what we produce, uh, we can, provide this um, either as a REST-based API, as a JSON file, into a you know, CSV file. I mean, there are multiple formats that we can potentially provide it into. Um, uh, and once we have that and the data definition, uh, then as a consumer of that information, you can use that downstream to process it um, and, and analyze it in any way you want, right? So when I talk about data, it is not necessarily the raw data because that's kind of happening behind the scenes. It's really more of the insights that are coming out. So the alerts and the notifications and the timestamps and the entire thing that we saw in that dashboard, that's what we that's what I'm talking about. Because that's ultimately what you want to use and, and process uh, in a downstream way. Okay. And another question. Um, it said, uh, how accurate are you in monitoring things like tomatoes, which we've talked about, right? The 
the old, I don't, I'm out of tomatoes and I need to make a DoorDash sandwich. Um, especially since most of the cameras that we have deployed out in the field today are low quality, low resolution cameras. Um, is, what, do you have a feel for kind of the accuracy on doing counts and so forth? Uh, you showed us the the pastry um, uh, the pastry kitchen. Um, what's what's your feelings on something as as weird as a box of tomatoes? Well, it's actually um, what we find is it's quite accurate. Um, I also have uh, my colleague uh, Jaydev and Jody, by the way, who are on and uh, can feel free to chime in if they have additional videos that we want to show. But I, I think what we only showed, because of the time limitation on this call, we only showed a couple of videos of the pastry examples. We actually have um, done a, a, a number of different types of you know, counting within a, a frame, a fixed frame counting of things in a very rapid sort of moving uh, scenario where the counts are varying fairly quickly and being able to sort of very quickly keep count, keep track of that count. So one example I'll mention um, is in terms of, uh, you know, like a very a small section of a belt where there are boxes uh, kind of being tumbling around and moving upside down and getting stacked one on top of the other and all that. And we've, we've been able to actually keep very quick track of that, including things of falling tomatoes. So sometimes when you're, you're picking tomatoes from bin, there's some that actually fall versus some that are that are grabbed and used, right? For for uh, let's say slices in a pizza or on a pizza or a burger or whatever. Uh, you can even keep track of how many have actually fallen down because they they didn't fit a profile of actually being used, right? Now, if within the region of view, if you know that that was picked up and trashed, then great. But if you don't care about that, you just want to know if they fell to the ground or they were fell on the ground or were used. We can do that. In terms of the percentage accuracy, I mean, I would say um, we've periodically done tests um, on on our accuracy in terms of where we get to. We're in the um, you know mid to high 90s in most of these cases, especially ones that are fixed camera, fixed view, and things that are you know very repetitive, right? So. And what I mean by that is there's a difference between counting tomatoes because that's really all you're looking at versus looking at a, a mall and a, a set of people in a mall entering and exiting from that, right? So a lot more variability there. So uh, depending on one or the other, uh, it, it varies, but they're they're more in the, in the, I would say, mid to high 90s uh, range in terms of uh, what, what, we, what we see. Uh, we also had another question, and what are the logistics of handling the video streams? Do they ever get sent off the local system for additional processing? In other words, move from the edge up to the cloud. Um, how long are they stored on the edge server, and what other privacy, privacy protections do you provide um, in addition to the, the blurring out of faces and PII? Yeah, that's a great question. So just to be very clear, we do not store any videos. The video is not stored in any edge system. All we're doing is we're processing it in a live streamed manner, which is why it's it's a beautiful system, right? Where you, so as an example, if you have a camera uh, that is generating a feed and that feed is today going into one of your own DVR systems that you might have for storage purposes, think of our edge device sitting between the camera and that DVR system, and it is processing the feed as it, uh, it is processing the video. Um, ironically, my video got frozen here. Hopefully, you can hear me okay. But uh, it is processing the video uh, as as it passes through the edge uh, device, and it's happening in real time. So all we're doing is uh, we're capturing the snapshots of the anomalies you're looking for, right? Spill on the floor, fire, smoke. Uh, you know, beer walk scenario that you've probably modeled or whatever it is that we're looking for, that snapshot is what is then captured and sent as part of the evidence uh, that we're sending to the cloud and the anomaly and the timestamp and everything else. So that's the only thing that that we uh, store. Um, and and so just to be very, very clear, no video is process, no video is stored on the edge device, no video is stored by us on the cloud, by Spark Cognition on the cloud. Uh, the second question you asked is, what other privacy protection we have? Uh, so as I said, if you don't care about evidence, you don't even need the evidence. You can just capture the anomaly, 
the evidence is usually helpful because otherwise it's a lot of he said, she said type of uh, you know an argument. Oh, you did this. No, I did not do this. So, so it's hard to verify. That's why we have that by default. But you can turn that off and you have no evidence, right? All you know is that the anomaly occurred and nothing gets captured. So that's one. The second is mm -hmm. if you do want the evidence but don't want to capture the, the, the brand or the face or the PII, you can, uh, as I said, you can, uh, we can toggle it to blur that piece of information out. The third thing is, as I said, there is nothing else, no other image or video gets sent out outside of your own system. So there's no other, um, uh, you know, um, uh, th there's no nothing else sort of to even consider here. Uh, the, the fourth thing I will say is it's, it's actually, I would reverse the point because honestly, if somebody needs to look at videos today within your own DVR system, so if you already have cameras, you're already monitoring, you're already storing data within your DVR systems, it is captured and stored, which means if there is a problem today, what you have to, the only alternative is for having some human person or people going through you know, hours and hours of video, which means they are actually looking at every single thing. With a system like the Visual AI Advisor, you don't need any of that. Nobody really needs to look at any video. No human needs to, unless there is an actual exception or, or an anomaly. So I, I think that it kind of reverses the entire privacy concern on its head, so to speak. So you know, so it's interesting. We're we're seeing a big movement to um, other computer vision use cases. So we've got uh, companies like Standard AI, uh, Grab and Go, who um, are using visual checkout, kind of like a la the Amazon Go, although a newer technology. So how would you coexist with somebody who's coming in and saying, "I'm going to use this visual checkout system"? Can you coexist using the same cameras as just separate feeds? How would you envision that happening? Absolutely. So um, the, the, one of the key things that we provide is the ability to configure many use cases per camera, right? Many use cases for the same camera. That's one of the biggest value adds is keep your existing cameras and number two, many uh, con configure multiple use cases to the same camera. And so what happens is, let's say you're pointing a camera at the, at the cashier with that same camera, there, if there is a camera pointing at the cashier register you know, zone, with that same camera, you can um, identify things like stocks of you know, products that is behind the cashier. Maybe those are important products or age-restricted products. And, and when it falls to a certain level, you can end cap, you can sort of send a notification to, you know, perhaps to the uh, supplier or the vendor uh, or the retailer. Uh, the same camera can be used to detect if there is you know, a person with an uh, armed weapon that is showing up at that cashier and send an alarm notification to the police perhaps or to you know some other security personnel. Uh, the same camera can be used to determine if any unauthorized person um, is, is standing in the backside of the, ca where the cashier is standing, right? Where only authorized people, uh, store clerks or managers are allowed. And you can detect that through, you know, and a denied access type of a person, right? Because we know who are supposed to be there. Everybody else is not allowed. Um, with that same sort of uh, camera, you can also detect if somebody is not provide is, has got a, a box of items and is not providing all of those box, uh, the, a bag of a basket of items and not providing all of those baskets, uh, all of those items to the cashier for being checked out. So the point is. Um, in a, in a scenario where you have a, a person-less register or virtual checkout type scenario, um, the camera is specifically looking for products and checkout and the only, that's the only thing, but we can use the same cameras and configure so many other different types of uh, examples uh, of use cases that really benefit uh, you know, the cleanliness of the store, compliance, safety, more product placement not just product selling, but that's the beauty of kind of what we provide here. So yes, absolutely, we're, we can definitely coexist and uh, and drive a lot more ROI from that same camera. Yeah, and, and just because uh, we're running close on time, but one of the anecdotal things that I found interesting is uh, you and I had talked earlier and I said, you know, what about doing a visual match between an ID and a face? Um, a week later, I came in and you showed me this running on commodity actually a pretty old laptop um, with 95% accuracy. So, you know, the, the power of this is that um, we can, you know, th they can come up with things that we, that, that, w that are unique to our industry. And so really the, this is kind of a foundation of how we do uh, 
uh, self-checkout from a traditional customer activated uh, POS terminal, but now we could add beer to that sale, which is about, you know, it's about 30% of our sales. So it, it's a good uh, example of how that power works. And that's also what I call a fire and forget system. It doesn't, it hasn't trained on my face, hasn't trained on my license. It's cold, and, but it does the match. And I think the only one we failed at was a guy who was showing a 30 year old ID. So he's, he didn't that's age right. gracefully. <laughs> but um, that's right. the, other thing that um, found really, the other thing I found that's really interesting is the confederated use case space. So as other industries within your portfolio come up with these use cases and you guys are writing the code underneath it to, to do this, this goes into the library, which I can then drag and drop. Is that true? That is correct. Yeah, so it is um, it is one where we are building the repository of use cases. Um, we've, we've already added, you know, a, a couple dozen use cases just in the last four months or so. And we can that that library of our use cases continuously uh, uh, is continuing to grow rapidly. And uh, and you're right. It is not just the use cases within this industry, but ones that we build, develop that are built in a completely different environment, but are applicable here. Um, you know, would make sense, right? So as an example, if there's an oil spill at the forecourt or if there's a, you know, water or soda that is spilled uh, inside the store and somebody needs to be notified immediately, these were ones that we had developed inside of a manufacturing environment and we, you know, uh, can very easily bring that into a uh, convenience store, retail store type of a scenario as well. So, uh, so yes, it, that, is a, that is a true statement, Gray. Yeah, and, and, and that one of the things I found was you, you you started out in the industrial safety space and we're doing a lot of stuff in there. And you just think about um, the insurance risk that we have in the forecourt where people are, are operating a fuel pump. Cars are trying to jockey for position if there's a, you know, if there's, um, a long line to get in. Um, so you can actually use this for the situation where a car is about to back over one of your other customers and put off an alarm. So, I mean, there's a lot of – when we start – peeling back the onion on this thing, there there are so many things that could be augmented observed with through observation, right? So a, a door counter that's using a sensor can count how many times the door are open, but if I got a family of three, four people just came in and on that one door open, so having that visual confirmation will actually tell you the traffic. So, you know, I, I don't think we've gotten our minds wrapped around all the applications and use cases, but I think what we saw today from a computer vision NLP um, uh, situation is it, it's a highly configurable system. It coexists, and it's something that you know we don't have to have all the use cases, but it's it's kind of a playground where we can start looking at some of those use cases. So it's really interesting stuff. Well, listen, we are at end of time. I'd like to thank Sridhar uh, and the uh, Spark Cognition folks for teeing up. Um, you know, with to me is one of the first use cases of computer vision for augmented AP, uh, IoT. Um, you're going to be in our booth at NAX, um, which is so you'll be able to, to play with some of these live things, do some some heat mapping, see the uh, the age verification application that we have. Um, so I encourage everybody on the call to um, make a trip over to our booth at the NAX show, and. Um, and really just start playing around with it and see what you can do. So it's a nice playground. Again, thank you, Sridhar. Thank you very much, Gray. I really appreciate the opportunity. And yes, looking forward to uh, showcasing and seeing many of you at NAX uh, at the Connexus booth. Fantastic. All right, bye for now.